separate thing of the Jewish humor and the film, which was a nice balance, but this was at least a book and the boys would get into it Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, uh, local law enforcement officers and first responders, firefighters. Uh, my name is Mehmet Sarakoglu. I'm the president of UK Intercultural Dialogue Organization and a, mom, a member of the uh, Turkish American Association of Kentucky in Louisville. We are honored by your participation to our 9-11 memorial event, Remember, Respect and Reunite. We deeply appreciate the support of the University of Kentucky and the Finance Administration in particular, and I would like to acknowledge Mr. Anthony Bates, Mr. Frank, Frank Butler's, and UK Police Chief Mr. Monroe's efforts to bring the program to this beautiful facility. We also would like to extend our appreciation to Lexington Police Chief Mr. Bastin and Fire Department Chief Mr. Jackson for inviting their co-workers to this program. Last but not the least, we are thankful for the support and the leadership of the Rumi Forum from Washington, D.C. We are going to start our program uh, with the reception. Uh, we are going to have an open buffet on the other side of the room. Uh, please uh, have your uh, meals starting from the uh, first two uh, tables closer to the, uh, to the other side of the room. And then uh, we will start our program after the reception. Thank you. <laughs> I hope that you are enjoying the dinner and uh, again we would like to thank to our uh, sponsors and supporters from the University of Kentucky and the uh, Rumi Forum from Washington DC. Before I would start my remarks, I would like to take a moment and uh, reflect on those who lost their lives 10 years ago on 9-11 and uh, have silent prayer for them. Thank you. Ten years ago, on 9-11-2001, the United States and the world were changed forever when the terrorists crashed four planes into the World Trade Center's Twin Towers, the Pentagon, and the field in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. 
on a crisp, clear September morning, killing thousands of Americans. The tragedy of 9-11 uh, not only exemplifies the most severe attacks ever perpetrated on American soil, but loss on a grand scale. Loss of life, loss of security, loss of hope, and even a feeling of loss in common humanity. Ten years later, it is not only paramount that we honor those whose lives were lost in the brutal attacks that we remember why they were lost. For probing into reasoning behind the attacks allows us to learn lessons, to move forward, and to realize why organizations such as UK Intercultural Dialogue Organization and Turkish American Association of Kentucky in Louisville, which is putting a similar program tomorrow, exist. Why did the attacks of September 11th happen? They were perpetrated because of hate, hate founded in ignorance and a lack of respect for human dignity. The terrorists who intentionally took so many innocent lives that they did not take into account the fact that many of those who murdered were Muslim in addition to those killed who were Jewish, Christian, Catholic, Hindu, Buddhist, agnostic or atheist. They did not care about who they were killing, whether they were Arab, Turkish, American, or from other countries. The terrorists' only goal was other destruction, corporeal and ideological. The attacks of September 11th embody not only a physical hijacking of planes with the intention of to kill thousands of innocents, a concept forbidden in the Quran, but also representing a hijacking of Islam itself. As President Obama said when Osama bin Laden was found and killed in May 2001, the terrorists are not Muslims, in fact, they are mass murderers of Muslims. Now is not the time to draw lines in the sand and to qualify and quantify people by how they look or what the, the uh, religion they practice. To quote a famous poet and the ten, uh, 13th century Islamic Sufi philosopher Rumi, don't hate me because I am you. Xenophobia, Islamophobia, and hate based on an igno ignorant us versus them mentality are of the past of death and destruction. Now is the time to unify and to celebrate our common humanity in the face of those extremists who would destroy it and us. A prominent and well-respected Turkish Muslim thinker, educator, and the peace advocate, Mr. Fethullah Gulen, was the first Muslim thinker denouncing the 9-11 attacks in a statement that appeared a few days after the attacks in the Washington Post, which reads as follows. We condemn in the strongest terms the, the latest terrorist attack on the United States of America and feel the pain of the American people at the bottom of our hearts. Islam abhors act of terror. A religion that professes who, un, uh, he who unjustly kills one man kills the whole of the humanity cannot condone senseless killing of thousands. Our thoughts, our thoughts and prayers go out to the victims and their loved ones." Unquote. Mr. Gulen has spoken against terror for 40 years. He always advocated for coming together of communities to overcome misunderstanding and increasing community harmony. Mr. Gulen was the first community leader to advocate and bring together Turkey's minorities Amongst them, uh, Jews, Armenians, Assyrians, and Greek Orthodox thus in, uh, increasing their visibility in the Turkish society. These intercultural and interfaith dialogue relations have a long history in our heritage that goes back for hundreds of years to the Ottoman era. I hope that you had a chance uh, to have a look at the frames that exhibit uh, how the Ottomans were able to cohesively and harmoniously live and provide the sanctity to their minorities. We are thankful to our friends in Rumi Forum who brought a portion of the reprints of original documents from the Ottoman archives to this event. I think it's a very fitting context to exhibit these Ottoman decrees by the sultans regarding their Armenian, Jewish, and Greek minorities dating back 550 years. The exhibit is brought only for this occasion and for a similar event in Turkish American Association of Kentucky and Louisville tomorrow. We are planning to bring the whole exhibit to UK and Lexington for a longer time as an open to public event and we will be in touch with you about the details of that exhibit soon. We also would like to take a copy, we also would like you to take a copy of the special issue of the Fountain magazine regarding the 10th year anniversary of the 9-11 attacks. This is a great compilation of articles looking from a global and uh, intercultural interfaith perspective to those horrific attacks. With the span of the writers around the globe from Norway to Greece and from Turkey to United States. 
I think the cover of the photo is very telling, showing the first responders for after a fire with a note. Rush to stop tears, transform weeping to laughter, mourning to praise, and storms of fire to breezes of pleasure. Again, we would like to honor the law enforcement and first responders who lost their lives on 9-11-2001 and recognize the local heroes in our community who are keeping us safe and secure on a daily basis. And thank you for joining us today. And thanks to our friends in Rumi Forum who brought the exhibit and the magazines along for this program. We look forward to being in touch with you in, uh, after this program and visit you in, our, in your offices in order to get, it, uh, get uh, know each other better in a multicultural campus and the multinational city we are living in. Thank you. We are going to have a short introductory clip about Rumi Forum and uh, we will have speakers uh, from the local law enforcement officers and University of Kentucky. Again, we would like to thank the Rumi Forum uh, for their participation, support, and uh, bringing the exhibit and the magazines for this program, which enriches the scope of the program. And uh, now we would like to uh, invite uh, Lexington uh, former police chief Anthony Beatty uh, to the podium. Uh, he went to a trip to Turkey uh, with his wife a couple years ago. And uh, we would like him to speak uh, and address uh, to our participants. Thank you. Thank you, Mohamed, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first of all, let me thank you uh, for being on the University of Kentucky's campus for this uh, very special event and occasion hosted by the, uh, the Rumi Forum and the Intercultural Dialogue Group from here on campus, as well as the Turkish uh, uh, American Association of America, and particularly the Louisville and Kentucky chapter. So on behalf of those folks, we thank you, but also thank you for being here on behalf of Dr. Eli Cupolito, Capoluto, excuse me, the new president here at the University of Kentucky and certainly Mr. Frank Butler, who uh, arranged assistance with financing this. Uh, with Chief Monroe's assistance, we were able to get funding to help um, Mehmet and the folks from campus out. Uh, it's important to be here tonight. Uh, most of you in this room are first responders, either law enforcement, fire officials, city officials, and those folks who certainly were impacted by the events of 9-11 that Mehmet spoke of up here earlier. Uh, and it's certainly the appropriate time to think about the relationships that we have with people who are different in our communities. And I, like most of you, if I think about uh, the events of 9-11, we all can reflect back and remember exactly what we were doing when we saw the first plane hit the uh, first tower, and then the second plane hit the second tower, and, and the events as they unfolded that day. But we also think about as first responders and remember what we did subsequent to that time, how we reacted, how we interacted, and what happened to our communities. And certainly those events changed our lives forever. Not only our lives, but our communities and the way we interact with people who are different from us. And so tonight, this event is about that. And I have to say that I commend Mehmet. Uh, stand up, stand up, Mehmet. He's, he's, he won't take credit for this. Stand up, please. Uh, Mehmet. <laughs> Any, all the other folks with the Interfaith Dialogue Group, please stand. Ameri Turkish American Association, please stand. Any Rumi Forum officials, please stand for just a moment. Thank you. These folks won't take much credit for it, but they work very hard behind the scenes to make sure events like this happen. Uh, and whether you realize it or not, they're all students working very hard, usually several PhD students working on their graduate degrees. They give boundless energies to, uh, to efforts like this, so we appreciate uh, what you do, uh, Mehmet and everyone. Uh, they sponsor events like this. This is their very first, uh, I guess, first, uh, first responders event. But they also host a Ram annual Ramadan dinner, which uh, is very, very nice uh, during the Ramadan season, uh, usually in conjunction with uh, Ambassador uh, Carrie Cavanaugh with the Patterson School of Diplomacy here on campus. 
a very nice event if you ever get an invitation, an opportunity to attend. It's a cultural exchange. It's an experience like none other that you would have. Uh, I can't get into the fasting quite yet, but I enjoy the dinner. So if you can, uh, attend one of those. They also host an interfaith, um, their inter intercultural dialogue, uh, excellence and ideas awards. And it's another, another annual event where they recognize uh, officials and leaders from our campus and our city and our community. Uh, the one thing that I do have to say is, I mean, Matt mentioned the trip to Turkey, and there is an annual exchange uh, to Turkey. And if you ever get the invitation, this is a must do in life. It would be one of those bucket list kinds of things that you should do. Uh, it is two weeks, it's two intense weeks, and you will be exposed to all of Western Turkey uh, and certainly have the opportunity for dialogue, cultural and religious interchange with not only the leaders in the Turkish communities, but the families. And that's the thing that I think Eunice and I remember most was the opportunity to sit down and share and break bread with families at night and, and get to know and understand them, their cultural differences and how we can make our world better. So if you have the chance to participate, please do that. Um, you know, growing up as an African-American young man here in Lexington, Kentucky in the 1950s and 60s, I certainly saw and understood firsthand what it would be like to be treated differently because of the color of your skin or your ethnic background or your religion or whatever. And I certainly understood the hurt that that brought. And so with that, it makes me think about our world today and how we are interacting with each other and certainly think about uh, how we stereotype individuals. I have to think about uh, how 9-11 uh, how changed our perception about uh, terrorism and acts of terrorism. Because if I think about the latest incident uh, with the young man in, in Norway, um, Anders, Anders Brevik, I believe was his name, he was uh, a young man who obviously planted a bomb and killed 12 people and then uh, shot and killed 68 people. And if you watch what was happening and unfolding across the world, uh, automatically that got pinned and stereotyped and tied to a terrorist act. In reality, he was a Norwegian citizen whose hatred was pointed at uh, the faith of Islam. And so we have to think about how we react, and particularly us in law enforcement, how we react, how we treat people, how diligent we are, and certainly how methodical we are with investigating crimes without uh, casting aspersions about who the suspects might be. Little did I know that in Lexington, Kentucky on 9-11 and the weeks after that, would we be faced with such a trauma in our community. And the trauma was not so much about the incidents that happened in New York and the Pentagon and, and in New Jersey, but it was about our community because it brought to me the reality of the fact that the university brings an international community to Lexington, Kentucky. And with that, there was acts of hatred and violence against individuals from uh, the Islamic faith. And so we had to band together and work with them here in this community. Many people in this room were part of that with Chief Bass and I think Major Stack, uh, other folks, or Commander Stack, other folks were very much instrumental and involved with that. I think Council Member Gordon will remember on 9-11, we had a huddle, a meeting uh, off to the side of the council chambers talk about what we did next, how we managed the problems that were going on in our community. So it's important for us to be ever vigilant in, in, uh, in here in Lexington, Kentucky in terms of, of what we do and how we respond and how we react. Uh, Islamophobia is, is something that we cannot, should not, and will not tolerate. Uh, just for your information, there are about 2.1 million uh, uh, people of, of Islamic faith here in the United States. That number is expected to, uh, to double by, in about 20 years. And so it's important that we, uh, we keep our mindset on how we make our whole community safe regardless of who people are and certainly what their beliefs are. Again, I just want to thank Mehmet, all the folks involved. Stay involved with these folks. They are doing a great job with exchange, exchanging information, giving us a better idea of how we can make our world a better place for everyone to live. Again, thank you for being here on the campus University of Kentucky. Thank you, Mehmet, all of you folks who work hard on this program. Now, I would like to invite uh, UK Police Chief Joe Monroe to the stage. I, I cannot uh, thank him uh, enough for his efforts to bring this program to this facility and his support to our organization. We would like him to uh, speak for a couple minutes for our law enforcement. Thank you. Just a couple. You can take the day off. All right. Well, thank you, Mehmet, um, and thank everybody for coming tonight. First of all, welcome to this event. It's a uh, special invitation to be a part of it because it's really important that we uh, continue to create 
and this critical opportunity to, for us to come together and foster uh, an open dialogue um, in this post 9-11 era. It's heartwarming uh, to see all of us here together tonight from different cultural backgrounds, uh, different first responders, uh, religions, with each of us having different traditions uh, that come with that. Um, the more important thing is we have to work together as partners uh, to ensure that the open lines of communication exist and are open and functioning properly uh, without any barriers in place. Speaking out against what um, Mr. Beatty referenced earlier is Islamophobia. It's particularly important uh, as we mark the 10th anniversary of the 9-11 attacks uh, as a terrorist you know, event. An event that not only changed America, but it also changed the world in many ways. It is important that we understand that these were jihadist extremists that were responsible for these deaths of nearly 3,000 Americans on September 11th, a fact that should never ever be forgotten. But the idea that Muslims are dangerous, um, you know, that's, that's ridiculous, it, it's false, it's ignorant, um, and that's from a lack of education and understanding. Uh, there can no longer be any doubt that these words of some of uh, these Islamophobes uh, have consequences. Just like the uh, terrorist attacks in Norway, uh, that Mr. Beatty referred to, uh, all these people that speak out uh, and hate Islam are the ones that are spearheading these uh, terrorist attacks around the world. The irony is that while these activists and even some of our own politicians try to demonize all Muslims based on the actions of a few terrorists, they try to convince Americans that Muslims uh, somehow are going to destroy our culture. Another false uh, implication. While experts say that it's impossible to predict who will become a jihadist, there is one commonality in virtually every, every case uh, of an American becoming radicalized, and that's attempting to either join a terrorist group or to launch an attack. That common thread is known to all of us as the Internet. The Internet is the leading thing that, that convinces a lot of people as they, they research and, and become radicals. In recent years, there's been a phenomenal growth in the number of and sophistication of English language, jihadist websites, chat rooms, blogs, making the message of violence and its ideological underpinnings far more accessible than ever before in the past. These sites typically contain rhetoric that demonizes Jews and attempts to, to justify the slaughter of innocents in the name of Islam. In reality, the fact is the vast majority of Muslims reject this extremist ideology and violence and this hate. A recent uh, RAND Corporation report found that only a hundred Muslims in this country have joined jihadism. About one in 30,000 based on a population estimated to be about three million in this country. A Pew Research poll in 2007 found that only five percent of American Muslims expressed a positive view of the 9-11 attacks or the terrorist ideology that many Muslims are blamed for. And that brings us to a more important fact that a recent study this past February released by the Triangle Center on Terrorism, Homeland Security in North Carolina found that Muslims have been the top source of tips to law enforcement to first responders in thwarting terrorist attacks. That brings us to tonight. That's why it's important for us to open and maintain this open dialogue and understand each other, respecting each other's cultures, beliefs, and traditions. And I can't say enough to Mamet, the Rumi Foundation, the Intercultural Dialogue Organization, in helping us accomplish this. Thank you, Mamet. Thank you, my friend. Uh, and thank each of you for being here tonight and taking those initial steps to keep this dialogue open. Thank you, Chief Monroe. Uh, I would like to uh, invite Lexington Police Chief uh, Ronnie Bastin to the stage next. Uh, he and uh, that time Chief uh, Mr. Beatty attended our second dialogue dinner in 2007, and he gave the award, uh, uh, our first uh, idea award to, uh, to Mr. Bastin, and then he replaced 
Mr. Best, uh, Mr. Betty uh, the following year. Uh, and he's been doing a great job uh, in Lexington uh, and with his uh, offices in the law enforcement. And we always appreciate his participation and support to our organization as well. Please, thank you. Well, thank you, Mehmet. Uh, thank you for the invitation to be here tonight to, for this event. Uh, I was thinking as I was watching the video there a moment ago what, how appropriate it would be that Mehmet be uh, nominated for the award for all the work that he's done in this community. I noticed that there are five chapters there, with Kentucky being one. I think that's something to, to be said about Kentucky and some of the progress that we're making and a lot of the work that's being done. And I tell you, there hasn't been a better champion uh, for dialogue than Mamet. And he's been to my office a number of times and we've spoken on a number of issues and he's a very committed young man. He's uh, tireless and the efforts that he puts into not only UK but the community, uh, I think go on, the recognition just hasn't been there. And, and I'd like to thank you for, for all that you do, Mamet, and your organization. Uh, as I was thinking about some things that uh, I remember about 9-11, uh, it's not a, not a pleasant time to sit and, and think back about 9-11, but I think for me, there are four things that I like to, to think about. I like to first of all remember the moment, and Chief Beatty said he remembered exactly where he was. I bet all of us can remember exactly where we were the moment we first got the news that an airplane had gone into the World Trade Center. I do, I couldn't believe it. Uh, I flipped on CNN and, and saw some of the footage and just could not believe what was happening. Being a pilot, uh, I thought, well, what could have gone wrong with the, the airplane equipment or the pilot flying the airplane? The thought didn't cross my mind that it was a terrorist event. And then not too long, there was a second plane. And then, and then all sorts of thoughts started to flow. And then the moments after that and the hours after that and watching the towers come down, I remember seeing after the first plane, I never thought that, the, that it would bring the tower down. You know, I, I realize now that with engineering and so forth that that, uh, that intense fire caused the entire structure to go. But there were so many things I think we learned and so many things I remember from that experience that I don't think I'll ever forget. Uh, the second thing I think that we have to remember and that really means something to all of us in public safety is remember the sacrifices that were made that day. It's the ultimate sacrifice for a number of people. We lost 3,000 people roughly in one event. And, that, and then we had events at the, the Pentagon and then Flight 93 in, uh, in Pennsylvania. The sacrifices that were made that day so that, uh, so that we could all be here today and, and hopefully have better prepared, or better prepared plans to deal with or prevent further acts of terrorism so remembering the sacrifices is, ex is extremely critical. Uh, remembering how it changed our profession and our lives. And there was a number of ways I think that that's occurred. And it's, it, to some degree, it's a personal thing. But just stop and think about a few negative things that, that uh, negative influences that these events cause. Think about the losses that families incurred with their loved ones. Think about parents who've had to send their children off to war since that time and all the, the grief and emotions and sacrifices that that has caused. Think about just everyday citizens faced with uncertainty about their day-to-day -day safety. Thinking about things that we've never had to think about before 9-11. Think about travel. You know, travel used to be something that was uh, sort of not a big hassle. You went to the airport and you hopped on a plane and you didn't have to go through all the security lines and checks and, and all those kinds of things that we do now uh, that are very necessary. And from a perspective of law enforcement and policing, think about the additional responsibilities that we all had to assume after 9-11. Uh, I know that many of the federal agencies uh, reprioritized some of their, their resources so they left things that they would have been responsible for investigating to state and local law enforcement and gave them the responsibility for that. So it's certainly changed our, our uh, lives and our profession in a number of ways. But I also think it's, it's very important to remember uh, the positive outcomes from 
the things that have occurred that have had a positive result out coming out from the worst tragedy that, uh, that we've ever experienced. What are some of those? I think we all, Americans of all races, faith, backgrounds, uh, have come together since the days of September 11th in a way like we had in many, many years. Public safety workers around the country have communicated and maintained dialogue and worked together uh, better than probably any point in history. Bonds of trust have been forged among citizens and public safety officials since 9-11 to a much higher degree than we'd seen at any point in our history. We're much better prepared to deal with, uh, with acts of terrorism today than we were at when 9-11 occurred. Several planned attacks have been, have been foiled due to very aggressive anti-terrorism efforts. So those are some, some positive outcomes, I think, that we shouldn't forget as we reflect on 9-11. Out of this tragedy, I think we've grown stronger, we've gotten better, uh, and we communicate more. Together, as community members, uh, people of faith, students, firefighters, public safety officials, we're better together than we are alone. And I hope we've realized that through all this. I encourage everyone in this room to continue to look for opportunities to build partnerships and look for the commonalities in others. Look for ways that we can help to make this community a better place to live. Thank you. Next, I would like to uh, invite Lexington Fire Department Interim Chief Keith Jackson to the podium. We had a, a great meeting a couple weeks ago and he was very supportive of this program and we would like to thank him to bring his, some of his officers and administrators to this program. Thank you. to get together here. Thank you, Mehmet. Uh, one thing I can say about him, he's really persistent. He's been, <laughs> he's been out to me for uh, two years to get here, so, and uh, now I'm here. So, and uh, on behalf of the Lexington Fire Department, uh, I'd like to, uh, to uh, thank you for having the opportunity to be here. Um, me personally, it's, it's, uh, it's, it was a, it's a unique opportunity for me because uh, not only am I a firefighter, but I'm also a soldier. So 9-11 had a significant effect on, on my, my life and my family. Um, as a firefighter, you know, the 403 public safety workers that lost their lives sacrificing to go and uh, save lives, it affected me uh, in that aspect. And then um, four years later, uh, I found myself on the, on the, on the sands of, of Iraq, in northern, northern Iraq, in Mosul, as an operations officer for a, uh, a sustainment battalion. And so um, when I look back and think about the effects of 9-11, of it, it, it's significant in my life, and it changed my life uh, for more than one reason. Um, and so I just kind of, in my words, I, I, I just went around and thought about the, the, uh, the, the, the reason why we're here, remembering, respect, and reuniting. And remembering 9-11, uh, which led to what's, what, what, as a soldier, we call GWAT, uh, the Go Global War on Terror. On that day, uh, it actually did more than separate, it united. It united us as a people and a country. Uh, I can remember uh, watching the news and seeing people of different faiths and different colors and different dialects and, and aspects of life working together. And, and that, that told me what, it, it revealed to me what America was really about. It was really about at the core being one. So as I remember 9-11 and I remember what I was doing 
And I remember going down to the road after dropping off my daughter at, uh, at school and then getting to my friend's house before we, work, we were going to work out or whatever. And we, we just watched it. And, and, and he's a professor and he's very, he's an intellect. And, and we start talking about it. And, and the one thing that he identified, and we both identified, is look at those people uniting as one. And, and that, that's, that has made a significant uh, uh, impact on my life as I move forward uh, in not only the fire service, but in the military, that we're all about the oneness. It also provided an opportunity for a, a, a growth opportunity for us as Americans. Um, if we look at that, that point in 2001 and we look at where we are today, we elected an African-American president. So, and we did that because the doors were open. People saw us as one and not just the individual sec sectors and sections of America. They didn't see white, they didn't see black, they didn't see his Hispanic, they didn't see Jewish, they didn't see Islamic, they didn't see Catholic and Baptist. What they saw was one and what they wanted was better. And so that is, as, as I remember and I reflect, it changed not only the individuals, but I think it changed America in itself and the mindset that it, that it had. Then I, take, then I move forward to respect. As I, as I went into Iraq and prepared to go to Iraq, I had to learn about Islam. I had to learn about the, the culture and the people. I had to learn to read from right to left and right and I had to learn the difference between the true aspect of what Al-Qaeda meant and what Jihad meant. And just like us as, as Christians, we have the different faith. We have Baptists and we have the Church of God in Christ. We have Church of Christ. That's all that, that, that Jihad and, and Al-Qaeda means. It's just a denomination of the Islamic religion. So I had to delve into and I had to understand how these individuals that were extremists used religion to attack our country and put us in, in, the, in the situation that we were in, in, de in defending the flag. So I learned to respect what Islam was. I learned a, a great deal about how the Islamic people functioned. So I, I, I gained a new respect for Islam and, 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 and the Muslim religion. And it, and it, and it gave us, the oper gave me and the soldiers, and I, I believe everybody that, that went to Afghanistan or Iraq, an opportunity to learn about the culture and the people. And then finally, reuniting. In the aspect of reuniting, it opened up the dialogue. And, and the dialogue that we have here today, even though it's a, it's a, a room of 50 people, we all walk out of here different because the dialogue has been opened. And I think this is the third or fourth year you've done this. It's not the first, but. For, for us, but yeah. But so as, as, as we move forward, this 50 will turn into 100, and the 100 will turn into 150. But each one of us have families and friends that we touch. So it will multiply into 150 will turn into 300 and 300 would turn into 1,000. And, and if you see what I'm saying, it'll grow. And that's what we want. We want the dialogue to grow. It creates opportunity. It cre creates opportunity for us to grow and expand, not only as people, but as, as intellects, as, 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 as a growth plate for what it is that we want out of each other. We just want to be respected. We want to be loved. We want to be taught. We want to learn about one another. It's an opportunity for investing, investing in, in faith and belief, and that we are here for a purpose. We're here for a purpose, and the purpose is to become better, better people, better Americans, a better world. And we don't get that unless we start investing in one another. So I thank you for the opportunity. I thank the University of Kentucky for allowing us to be here and come together. I thank all my, my fellow brothers in, in, the, uh, in the public safety arena, the police department at UK and Lexington, because without us 
supporting our community and doing the things and being willing to sacrifice for our community, we wouldn't have such a safe community. So I thank you um, and I hope that this continues to grow and we take this 50 and make it 300,000. Thank you all. Before Chief Jackson goes, we, we would like to as a token of our appreciation. Another picture. <laughs> Another picture. <laughs> uh, in our meeting a couple of weeks ago, we uh, extended an, uh, a frame that had uh, the water marbling art. This has the state flower of the Ottoman Empire, which is tulip. So I hope you would enjoy it. Thank you. Thank you. Before we go into the closing remarks, uh, I would like to invite Chief Best into the stage for his. Next, I would like to invite uh, Chief Monroe. I think he left. So this gives us another uh, opportunity to visit him. So we will do that. <laughs> 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 Next, uh, I would like to invite uh, UK Assistant Provost, Mr. Greisman, uh, to the podium. Uh, he has been a long supporter and a friend of our organization. And I didn't know that, but uh, he has worked as a volunteer firefighter years back, and I think he has some uh, things to remark from the heart and the mind. Mm -hmm. That's what he said. So <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Mack. Okay. Um, I would rather not use the microphone. I've been a teacher too long to believe that I can't be heard. <laughs> I am. Um, I come first to um, offer greetings and apologies. President Capilouto and Provost Subhaswamy hoped they could be here. They both had schedules that had unmovable appointments at this time. So I bring both their greetings and their uh, words of disappointment because um, they would, uh, would like to have been here. I uh, bring you an apology because you get me instead. Um, I want first to simply pay tribute and thanks to all of you here, not just for who you are, but what you represent. It's a hard time being a public servant. It's a hard time because our politics has demonized anything that has the word public in it. And I won't go on much more because I don't want to get too political. But I can't help but say, as someone who for 30 years has been a high school social studies teacher, has been a volunteer firefighter, has been an elected public official, has been a university administrator at a public institution, and an incorrigible citizen, I resent the fact that what we do is seen as something other than it is and that is glorious. What we do is sacrifice self for others. I can remember too many nights I sat in my den watching the television after 9-11 weeping because I knew what it meant in that moment the firefighter said, I'm going up knowing full well the likelihood that he or she came down was infinitesimally small. I was uh, going to a block fire one time. We, we had the only hook and ladder, the only aerial uh, uh, engine in um, that part of Madison County because we protected the university. The university gave us money to buy a, and maintain the aerial ladder because they knew if they had a dormitory fire they would need that ladder. 
So when Sherbro and Earlville had a block fire that rivaled some of the block fires in some of the small communities around this area, we went because firewalls were simply not um, um, part of the structure, and it um, spread quickly. I took my turn at the top of the ladder, um, thick smoke, really um, um, pretty horrific. Um, I was sitting on the tailgate. I saw some guys go into the building. I'd made a mental note, make sure they come out. I must have been distracted because they apparently came out, but I didn't know it. There was that moment when I realized, because I started to see smoke through the seams of the mortar, that the building was losing, uh, was losing its integrity. I knew I had a decision to make. I could sit there and really hope those guys came out or I could do what I knew I had to do, run into the building real fast, get to a place where I could be heard, yell, if you're in here, the building is going to collapse and run out even faster. I got halfway back to the fire truck, the building collapsed, and I said, that's not a story I'm going to tell my mother. I begin to know only begin to know what each and every one of you do every day. You put your lives on the line. And I'm one really proud and grateful individual. So I celebrate you, and I celebrate the fact that you are public servants. During my time in, in Hamilton, um, I uh, served 10 years as a volunteer firefighter. Um, it's um, one of the things I just simply find most honorable, most um, rewarding of all the work I've ever done, also the most terrifying. I have a recurring nightmare that I'm driving this 14-ton fire truck, and it's out of control. I had no business driving a 14-ton fire truck. I will admit in a moment of weakness that when the fire siren went off, I sort of ran to the firehouse, but I calculated how many guys got there before me to make sure that I wasn't one of the drivers. On three occasions, I didn't calculate quite right. The chief said, hop in, and I started saying prayers in every religion and language I could think of. Um, it's um, uh, not what I was meant to do. I actually joined to be an EMT. I was the captain of the rescue squad, but it was a fire department too small to specialize. If there was a, an accident, I was an EMT. If it was a fire, I um, uh, hauled hose. There was a defining moment in the fire department while I was there, and I want to try to connect this to the other reason we're here tonight, which is to talk about um, mutual understanding, about conversations over the fence, about intergroup dialogue. The fire department had celebrated its 100th anniversary, and in that 100 years, there were how many women firefighters? None. Until Henry Harder's Camellia came of age. Henry Harder was the village historian, the fire department's historian, the most revered individual I think I've ever known. And Henry's daughter came to Henry one day and said, Dad, I'm going to apply to be a fireman. And Henry, Henry tells me he looked at her and said, please don't do that. Well, Henry raised the kind of child he was proud of, but he got what he deserved. Camilla said, Dad, you know I'm going to do it because that's what you taught me to do. It was a moment of angst because we were very comfortable being an all-male fire department. And suddenly we had to decide, were we going to say no to Camelia Carter? Were we going to say no to Henry? And I've never seen a bunch of guys so anxious. Quiet talk, conversation, what do we do? Camelia was the first female firefighter in the village of Hamilton Volunteer Fire Department. She became an EMT. She worked under me for the years that I was still there, probably about four or five. She was a valued member, and I dare say, if I checked, Camelia is probably not the only 
female firefighter in the volunteer fire department of Hamilton, New York, but it was a defining moment. And after she joined, the ladders did not break, the hoses did not fall off, the sky did not fall. And I would dare say we were better for it. And so the message I leave you with tonight is really twofold. First and foremost, that my respect for each and every one of you is unbounded. Thank you for what you do. And thank you all for being leaders in showing us that we can have a diverse, multicultural, multi-gendered set of public institutions and do good work. Thank you so much. Good night. Thank you, Mr. Grossman. Uh, we would like to uh, close our uh, program uh, by thanking you for coming tonight. And uh, we would like to uh, extend our uh, invitations to other members of the uh, Lexington Law Enforcement. And we would like to visit you in uh, your respected offices and get to know each other better and uh, participate in your uh, uh, socials and uh, hopefully you will have a, a great weekend with the Louisville game. <laughs> so fingers crossed on that. Uh, please have a look at the exhibit uh, as you are walking out uh, and uh, please take a copy of the Fountain magazine of the special issue of 9-11. And again, thank you so much for coming and thanks uh, for their support and leadership to the University of Kentucky and Rumi Forum. Have a good night.